can we all move into the main plenary session? We are about to begin the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, could we all start moving to the main plenary session?
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honorable guests, uh, those who are online, our speakers, uh, we greet you this afternoon, and a special warm welcome to all of you on this uh, session, uh, panel session, which will be discussing investment in the halal sector. Uh, my name is Kaya Ngaga. I'll be uh, moderating this uh, panel. And uh, I actually, right now, I'm working as acting CEO of the KZN Growth Fund. Thank you very much. Without much ado, uh, let, let's, let's start with the business of the day. I'll start by introducing our panel. Most of our panelists are, are, are joining us virtually, and we have one panel member who's here uh, physically, uh, Mr. Amin Hassan, who's a national head uh, Sharia banking at Standard Bank. Uh, welcome, Mr. Hassan. And uh, virtually we have Mr. Aman Mohammed, is a CEO FNB Islamic Banking. He'll be joining us uh, virtually. Welcome, Mr. Mohammed. And we have Mr. Sadiq Dindar, who's a Middle East Events and Marketing South African Tourism. He's also joining us uh, virtually. A special welcome to Mr. Dindar. And Mr. Zubair uh, Mughal, who's a CEO, Al Huda Center of Islamic Banking and Economics in Pakistan. He's joining us uh, virtually. Uh, welcome, Mr. Mughal. And uh, Mr. David Tan, Chairman SFMA Singapore, FNB, Industry Role Players, is joining us virtually. Welcome, Mr. Tan. And apology from Mr. Umar Munsur, uh, the founder uh, club at his uh, funding professional in Singapore, who couldn't make it to, to join this, this session. So thank you very much uh, to our our, 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 panel, our panelists that are joining us this afternoon. Uh, without much ado, the way we are going to do it, uh, we are going to allow our panelists to introduce their organizations, what their organizations are doing, and uh, what is the role that their organization can play in terms of bringing investment in the halal sector in, 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 in South Africa. So I will start with uh, Mr. Amin Hassan of Standard Bank, who's here with us. It's, uh, it's uh, seven to 10 minutes. Maybe you can share with us one, one example of your experience as well. And then we, 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 from there, we'll proceed to the next panelist. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulin Nabi al-Kareem. Respected guests virtually and uh, in the audience, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God Almighty descend upon all of us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I think it would be remiss of me not to just position a little bit of the history of uh, Islam in particular, because I think a lot of the times we take the halal economy and the halal sector and we say it's this great thing, but the infrastructure that was built prior to that that allows us to actually have a thriving halal sector in South Africa uh, is important to understand. And if you go back into the history just briefly from a South African perspective, you've got possibly Islam in South Africa from the dawn of South Africa itself, with uh, the West Coast and the story of Jan van Riebeck and the Dutch East India Company coming down the West Coast of South Africa, with Indonesian and Malaysian indentured laborers coming through uh, on the West Coast. So you see Islam starting to come through from the Western Cape as early as the 18th century in South Africa. And on the East Coast with the, the British colonization taking place of, of Natal and the Indian indentured laborers. So there's strong relations with the international Islamic market in South Africa from as far back as the 18th century on both the east and western coasts uh, of South Africa. And what that 
uh, has done is you had Muslims being part and parcel of the fabric of South African society for all of these 250 years. And what that has allowed us to do is actually become a proper positive contributor to, to the economy of South Africa. And if you look at just any sector within the South African economy, you would see that there is a halal component or an Islamic element or a Muslim being a captain of one of those, uh, one of those industries. But I think it, it's massively unpatriotic of us to sit here and say these things without recognizing that it is as a result of our government and the country that we live in. Because without the environment of being able to practice your religious freedoms, you would not have such a thriving halal sector and thriving halal environment. And I think one of the things that we often miss about South Africa and its context is that while we may have had racial tensions through our history, we have never had religious tension. We have always been a deeply religious country. We have always been a very deeply religiously tolerant country. Our, our anthem starts with invoking God's name, uh, or invoking God. So I think it's an important point to, to point out as well, because we have a great regulatory environment uh, from, a, from a financial services perspective or from an investment environment perspective. Um, and if you just take the benefit that we have from the Anglo-Saxon sort of corporate model that we've employed across most of our industries that allows us to, to enter into a globalized economy uh, quite well. I think some of the other things that we need, to, we need to touch on is we often look at South Africa as an investment destination and we look at the sovereign first. And we know that in the recent past we have suffered some downgrades. Uh, but uh, the important thing for me is we need to try and pierce that sometimes. We need to look beyond just the corruption and the state capture and all of the noise in the media because if you actually pierce the sovereign, and you get into the actual companies that make up our economy, that are possibly the largest employers and also the largest contributors to the revenue of South Africa and the GDP of South Africa, you would find possibly some of the best institutions uh, in the world. They are well managed, they have great governance protocols in place, and they are possibly some of the best investment destinations that you'll find on the planet. So I think that, for me, is, is some of the important things that I wanted to, to say. And part of those great companies that you find in South Africa are Muslim-owned companies or companies that fall within this broad definition of, of what halal is. And from a bank perspective, uh, I'm good to know that my colleague Aman is on the line as well. So I, I don't want to... I don't want to spend too much of time possibly on getting into banking semantics uh, because maybe that will come out in some of the more operational or technical discussions as the panel unfolds. But banks have always been a central point to any economy. We are the intermediaries between surplus units of liquidity and deficit units of liquidity. Uh, and we have always intermediated payments, the facilitation of trade, cross-border payments, etc. So. I think if you just look at, uh, at our banking institutions within South Africa, uh, we, if you take one of the big events of recent uh, financial history in, in the 2008 financial global crisis, South African banks were very resilient. We have always maintained great capital levels. We have always maintained great regulatory and liquidity buffers. And we, so we were quite fine through that entire crisis. Yes, there were... There were some, some nudges that, uh, that we had to take here and there, but by and large, uh, our banks in South Africa are actually quite well regulated, well capitalized, and great institutions. So if you take Standard Bank as an example, we've got presence in 17 countries across Africa. Uh, we've got another presence in five or six very key international markets. The Middle East, uh, on, the, on the western side of the world, you've got New York, in Europe, you've got London, 
and uh, on the east, you've got uh, China. For our, for our offshore services, we've got a uh, presence in the Isle of Man, Jersey, Mauritius, and we are owned by the largest bank in, in the world, which is ICBC, 20% is owned by ICBC, and what that does is it gives us the ability to facilitate this, this global movement of, uh, of capital, of funds, uh, and of trade. So I think from a banking perspective, uh, we, we have great banking institutions to facilitate the trade and investment that I believe is actually quite ripe and available in South Africa. Um, and yes, we have the, the government to thank for accommodating the regulatory changes that now allows for investment to flow in South Africa um, in a Sharia compliant way. So we have amendments to our Income Tax Act, to our VAT Act, to our Transfer Duty Act, uh, and continuously additions being made uh, to those pieces of legislation to accommodate for the parity of treatment for investment flows within the halal sector. So I think uh, maybe I would leave it there and, and open up to my colleagues uh, and see what they have to say as well to, to complement uh, the conversation and hopefully we can engage in, in more robust discussions as it progresses. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, without much ado, I'll ask Mr. Aman Mohammed to, to give us an overview about his this organization, which is FNP Islamic Banking. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, and a, a warm welcome to um, all the participants, and I'd like to greet my fellow panelists as well. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And a good afternoon to everyone else out there. Um, Kaya, thank you for, for this, and I think uh, my colleague Amin Hassan has done a good job in laying the foundation um, to where we play a role as Islamic banks within this economy. Um, I think the first thing that I would like to add is halal is more than just what you eat. And I think when you look at an Islamic bank, typically we like to view ourselves as those who enable uh, this concept of halal investment within a particular economy. Uh, in South Africa, the Muslim population is reputed to be around maybe two to two and a half percent, but the contribution that we make to the overall economy is far greater than the two percent that we talk of. Um, for us, Islamic banking, <clears throat> in my opinion, is a facilitator to growing this uh, the halal and industry within South Africa. And I think with what we've achieved as a country, and I'm not going to go through the accolades that Amin had put forward before me, but in order to achieve what we've already achieved by becoming one of the first non-Muslim countries uh, to issue a dollar-based sukuk, where an Islamic structure was utilized to benefit the people of South Africa, and that was in the form of a $500 million sukuk, that was issued by the South African sovereign in 2014. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, um, we have been asked and tasked between our bank and, and, and Standard Bank to further look at how we can support the government with the issuance of a further support. And I think one of the key things uh, that we see in terms of reconciliation between um, conventional banking and Islamic banking is with much attention that is being focused on environmental, social, and governance principles of late. Uh, you know, these are principles that have already been embodied within Islamic principles. And the ultimate criteria of the kind of services and products that we as Islamic banks provide to our customer base is based upon these elements of good governance, good social behavior, and excellent environmental conduct. So the key thing that I would like to add is that from the perspective of the bank that I represent, uh, being FNB Islamic Banking, um, we like to view what we offer as not just something for someone who is an adherent of the Islamic faith. Rather, we believe that Islamic banking is a credible alternative to anyone who chooses, irrespective of their faith, or their creed. 
And I think this is quite an important point to take into account because when we look at the definition of the word halal, halal is something that is good, something that is right for you. The Arabic term, which I suppose I mean, will, uh, will delve into deeper at, at some point, is the word tayyab. And I think we need to understand that what we offer is not just for Muslim people. And in doing what we do, um, we found that Islamic finance product continued to evolve. And South Africa has actually provided a fantastic opportunity platform for us to actually further grow this proposition. Uh, I'm proud to be part of an industry that continues to register um, continual double-digit growth over the last 10 years. And I think that speaks a lot um, for the demand of these Sharia compliant or Islamic type structures that not just the ordinary man in the street or businesses around, but rather sovereigns and countries in Africa and internationally are looking for, which allows for this phenomenal growth. Um, FNB Islamic Banking has uh, been largely involved in the development and offering of Islamic financial services to the retail, commercial, corporate, institution, and even international markets. Um, I think with the infrastructure that we have in South Africa being a robust banking platform, um, offering some of the most sophisticated Islamic legislation on the continent, I strongly believe that South Africa plays an exceptionally important role in the furtherance of developing a halal economy or halal investment opportunities, not just in South Africa, but across the entire continent. Thank you, Kyle. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. That was quite a mouthful. And if we could go to Mr. Sadiq Tindar of uh, South African Tourism, over to you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Gaia. Um, Salaamu Alaikum to my fellow panelists and to the audience um, in Durban. Uh, it obviously is a very great honor to be here, part of this uh, first World Halal Expo taking place uh, in South Africa. Um, just a bit of a background of myself, I think just a correction on the, on the title there, uh, Gaia. It's, uh, I'm the manager of marketing promotions for Middle East in Turkey at South African Tourism. Um, the, uh, my, my role here is a very different role uh, in comparison to my fellow panelists. Uh, I, I, I work in the, uh, in the sector of tourism um, and with South African Tourism, who's the official marketing agency for South Africa uh, in my capacity as the manager of marketing promotions for Middle East in Turkey. Um, and as we know, South Africa is a very well positioned when it, comes from a tour, when it comes to tourism, um, of course, the last two years has been very hard, not in South Africa, but globally to all of the uh, countries who have been affected uh, by, by COVID and of course in tourism in general. Uh, but just in, when it comes to, to South Africa in particular, when it comes from a tourism perspective, and I think my two uh, panelists prior to me um, during my introduction have, have really summed it up very beautifully, both from a, from a um, investment point of view, but also just as, as South Africa is a destination. Um, I think I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, as a country, we are, we are very blessed that we're a very diverse country and uh, our late president Nelson Mandela had coined us the Rainbow Nation and we really live by that in, in, in the sense that the respect um, for, for each other and the tolerance for each other. And I think South Africa in, in particular has been very, very welcoming to both uh, local uh, South Africans who live here and practice the religion freely, but more importantly also for I think tourists to come into our country um, and, and wanting to experience the halal um, elements um, and, and our infrastructure from halal perspective is absolutely um, a very, there are many, many factors that, that lead to it. Uh, of course, one is the fact that we live in a very, uh, tolerant society in a society that respects each other and in a very diverse uh, country. Um, so I think when tourists come to our country in particular from a tourism perspective, and I think my, my, my message that I would like to share both with my panelists and of course even with the audience 
fact that um, when investing in the halal tourism sector, uh, you know, you would definitely see a return on investment, um, you know, that, that would obviously give you the opportunity to, to see an increase of halal tourism coming into our country. We're seeing tourists come from many different parts of the world. Uh, we have representation in Europe, in North America, uh, in South America, in Southeast Asia, in India, in Australia, the Middle East, in Turkey as well. So from that perspective, from a global perspective, we look out to, to encourage as many travelers and tourists to come into our country. Of course, there are many different niche segments that will travel to South Africa and all have a particular reason. But when it comes to, from, from a halal perspective, uh, both Muslim and non-Muslim products, I take extra precaution in taking care of the needs of the traveler. Um, and I think my panelists just before this had mentioned that halal is not just about the food. And I think often that's where most people get uh, kind of have uh, fixated on in terms of having to ensure that if they offer the halal food, that's about the best that they can do from a halal perspective. It's the entire value chain around, um, you know, you've got modest fashion, uh, you've got cosmetics, you've got uh, tourism activity that are linked and halal travelers would like to explore. Of course, you've got different segments of travelers that might who would be able to um, travel to travel for particular reasons. And I think from a from a country perspective, the infrastructure is set up. Um, I think the attraction for the tourists would be a lot more easier. Um, for us, particularly, um, both from a local perspective. We have the many different halal authorities um, who ensure that we, we follow very strictly when it comes from a halal perspective in terms of what we offer. Um, and, and then globally also, we recognize very strongly um, where the associations in, in, in Europe, uh, in Southeast Asia, even in North America, who have positioned South Africa as a very, uh, you know, amongst the top five destinations when it comes to take catering for the needs of the halal traveler. Um, so from my end, uh, what I like to share with uh, with the audience is the fact that we are really open as a country um, to ensure that we uh, we will uh, continue to promote the destination and encourage travelers to come in and experience the halal tourism offerings but we also don't want to ensure that we limit ourselves in terms of saying that it's only open for muslim product owners to pr to promote halal travel to muslim travelers there are the, the opportunity there is for all, all in sundry, including non-Muslim product owners and who many have taken on um, the pro uh, ensuring that they take care of the needs of the Muslim traveler. Uh, and doing it quite actively and in particular case at the end of the Western Cape. Even in Limpopo, we we'll keep my, my introduction very short and happy to engage further. Uh, yeah, ap apologies. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we, we've lost uh, Mr. Dindar to, uh, I think there's a poor network on his side as well. So maybe Wise is still uh, sorting himself out. We can move to Mr. Mughal uh, of Al Huda Center of Islamic Banking and Economics in Pakistan. Over to you, sir. Nawadu Nasalila Rasulayt Kareem. Amabad, Pauz Billah, Ibn Shaitan, Adim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thanks to the organizers for having me in this important event where we are discussing about Islamic finance, halal industry, halal tourism, and other components of halal industry. Briefly, let me start with the size of the industry. If we see the global size of the halal industry is about $7.1 trillion, which includes food, non-food products, services like Islamic banking, tourism, and as well as cosmetic, apparel, motors, fashion, etc. 
as per uh, careful estimate, more than 3,000 industries are based, which are directly linked with the halal industry. And uh, you know very well that the total Muslim population in the world is about 1.8 billion people. And uh, those Muslim population is in mostly in Asia, and the second largest Muslim dominated continent is Africa, then Europe, North America, Australia, and the last, the South America. So after Asia, Africa have a lot of opportunities in halal industry. And similarly, Islamic banking industry is giving a fuel, a financial fuel to the halal industry. But if we see that what is the size of the halal industry and what is the total size of Islamic banking industry, you will find a big gap. Total Islamic banking market is around Islamic banking and finance market $2.9 trillion. While the component of the halal industry is about $7 trillion. So I believe that uh, there is a lot of room for the development of Islamic finance industry so that we can provide 100% Sharia compliant financing to the halal industry. And when we talk about Islamic finance industry, as I mentioned, the total size is about $2.9 trillion in which we can segregate Islamic finance industry into seven major components. One of the major components is Islamic banking, 80% of global Islamic finance market belong to the Islamic banking. The second major component within the Islamic finance industry is Sakuk and Islamic capital market. The total 9% of the uh, share of the Islamic finance industry belong to the Islamic capital market and Sakuk. Third component is Takaful. Islamic microfinance, fintech, Islamic indices, and other component. But still, uh, there is a lot of gap. Three years before, I wrote one paper that whenever we certify any food or non-food product, we have to see different elements. Unfortunately, one of the elements which is uh, we can see a neglected area. We do not see that what are the sources of finance for that halal product. And in opinion, some Sharia scholar, we try to take some fatwa that either for a halal certification agency, we have to see the sources of financing or not, and even their insurances. So that is a debatable uh, issue and challengeable as well. But if we will link is halal industry that all the component and, and financing need of the halal industry should be met with Sharia compliant financial instrument, then Islamic banking will emerge in a very broader perspective. As per concern about uh, South Africa, South Africa have uh, very good statistics about Islamic banking I visited South Africa a couple of times, and I was surprised that in a country where Muslim population is about 2%, but they have six, seven Islamic banks. Among them, there is a one full flat bank also exist in South African market. Then again, they have Islamic fund, Islamic asset management companies. And as uh, my previous honorable speaker mentioned that, South Africa also have a very good experience of Sakuk as well. So we can say that in, in a country where Muslim population is very, very limited, but that Islamic banking infrastructure is very good, not only for the Islamic banking, but even in South Africa, South Africa have a very unique name in halal industry. One of the CB of the South Africa that is working all over the world, including UAE in Pakistan and et cetera. So which is giving a new shine for South African market for their image of halal. If we uh, 
compare South African, especially Islamic banking market to other African countries, uh, because uh, uh, my organization, Al Huda Center for Islamic Banking and Economics, we are working in Africa, by the way, right now I'm in West Africa as well. So we have experience to work in more than 30 African countries for Islamic banking. But one thing which we always appreciate to the South Africa that in South Africa, when they introduce Islamic banking in the country, they introduce Islamic banking as a banking product. Therefore, Islamic banking is equally popular with a Muslim and non-Muslim segment. I met with the one of the CEO of Islamic banking operation in South Africa. They said our about 50% clients are non-Muslim, or even 53%. And when I compare South African Islamic banking market to other African countries, I didn't saw such type of statistics. For example, in Nigeria, Nigeria is a country of more than 200 million population. Among them, 50% are Muslim. But in South Africa, the non-Muslim population who are utilizing Islamic banking product is only 8 to 9%. What is the difference? Because in South Africa, they introduce Islamic banking product as a banking product. But in Nigeria, in Tanzania, and some other countries, they did one mistake. They introduced Islamic banking product as a religious product. Therefore, only the Muslim segment of the society are utilizing Islamic banking product, and non-Muslims are a very limited intervention with Islamic financial product. In short, the regulators made a very good strategy in South Africa to introduce Islamic financial products and even for the halal industry. In South African market, as I explained that I used to be work over there, I saw one missing component that in South Africa, I visited many religious school madrasas in Pretoria, in Durban, in Cape Town as well. They have a very good Sharia scholar. They have a very good knowledge about Islamic finance and halal, but the Sharia knowledge. And at the second end, another extreme in South Africa, you will find a very good banking and finance professionals. But what is the missing component that the Sharia people have a limited interaction with the banking and finance? And banking and finance professional have a limited interaction with the Sharia. So both tools extremes are available in South Africa for the development of Islamic banking and halal industry. If we bridge the gap between the two extremes, I think so uh, in South Africa, we need to organize some banking and financial and food technology based courses for the Sharia scholars so that they can have an understanding of the conventional side. And similarly, for the banking, finance, and food technologies, we should have some courses related to the Sharia and the Sharia interventions. And after having these, this bridging the gap, I am very much sure we can generate a very good human resource in the South Africa, and which will definitely serve the other African markets as well. In the Africa, we can segregate Africa into the four or five geographical location in East Africa. Yes, in East Africa, there is a very good development of Islamic banking and halal industry like Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Somalia. You can find a very good halal certification agencies over there and as well as Islamic financial institution. In North Africa, the Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, again, they have a very good Islamic banking industry. They have experience of Islamic banking, the Kafur, Sakuk, Islamic microfinance, and et cetera. Then the West Africa, in West Africa, Nigeria, Senegal, Mali, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, these are the countries where they have established Islamic financial institutions. But unfortunately in the West Africa, 
there are a missing component of the halal certification uh, agencies because uh, you know in west and central africa most of the countries are the francophones and in the french speaking country they didn't have a very good literature related to the halal industry or islamic making industry uh, even uh, whenever i travel to the west african especially francophone countries i fear being the traveler i fear a lot of limitations for the halal food and etc i think so uh, the our honorable audience from the halal certification agency they have to focus for the west uh, african markets for the halal certification and the then south africa as a country and the, as a continent other neighboring countries also have a very limited islamic banking organization but in the south africa yes they have being the country they have a good islamic financial industry so this is the brief as per the topic and i'll be available if there is any question thank you without much ado we'll go to mr tan uh, from uh, sfma singapore to give us his uh, se seven to ten minutes uh, overview and then we'll, we'll get to the questions and then uh, i'm sure the audience can't wait to engage you as well on these very important issues that you've raised over, over to you mr tan thank you so much yeah thank you the organizer a warm welcome to the panel speakers and all the audience uh, present today. Uh, in fact, I will be saying uh, good evening uh, to the Singaporeans here because uh, it's uh, six hours uh, ahead of your time. So let me introduce myself. My name is David Tan. Uh, I'm actually the president of the Singapore Food Manufacturer Associations. This association was started 57 years ago, and today we have close to 450 members uh, serving the food made from Singapore. In fact, Singapore, as you understand, is a very small country. We have only 728 square kilometer, and out of this small little island we have 5.8 million of people living here and 100 percent in fact of our food 90 percent are imported and only 10 percent we are only self-sufficient so a little bit of my uh, associations that i would like to uh, introduce these associations, as I mentioned, uh, started 1967. And today, actually, we organize 60 over industry activities annually. So be it like a capability workshop, oversee tasty Singapore trade shows, and supermarket promotions, oversee studies, trade missions, network, and the business matching sessions for all businesses around the world. So we are a team comprises of a highly skilled, experienced professionals that we offer service based on our business, best business practice, consumer trend, and a new potential market opportunity across the demography in compliance with the ethical procedures and standards. A bit of backgrounds of SFMA. SFMA unite, unites all the local food manufacturer for the benefits of growth. And also we get together all the food manufacturer and supporting industry so that we can get better economic or scale and bargaining power in terms of our sourcing and also marketing our products worldwide. So we act as a bridge between the relevant government authority and food manufacturer to respond effectively to the government's policy in promoting and developing of the food industry. So basically, we are act as a primary intermediary for local and foreign businesses matching and contacts to 
together. So Singapore SFMA vision is to become the food hub of the ASEAN and the food industry to remain as one of the key supporting pillar to drive the growth of our Singapore economy and also including helping our local food manufacturer to grow and strengthen our marketing positions by facilitating, promoting exports, productivity and innovations. Now, we have the next slide, please. So as you can see that we know that the Hala, global halal market is so huge, you know, having the US dollars 6.3 trillion and one of the biggest markets is the halal food that contributed 1.3 trillion. So as you can see, food is a very Hala food is a very important that markets that right now all our manufacturers are getting our products to be certified Hala and also lots of our facility are going into producing of Hala food for the rest of our ex exports. Next slide, please. Now, very important question is, why do we select Singapore? Now, Singapore is strategically located as a gateway to some of the 350 million Muslims in Southeast Asia. It will serve as a significant factor for the potential growth of the halal industry for this ASEAN country. So Singapore as a trade hub which help boost halal trade between Singapore and also the GCC country and the rest of the world. So Singapore market for halal food and beverages has grown at about 5.5% for the past five years. It is revealed that almost 57% and 37% of the consumer in Indonesia and Singapore, respectively, prefer halal cosmetic personal care products over conventional cosmetics. There are more than 50,000 types of products are halal certified in Singapore. So this halal certified premises actually has grown almost 60% in the past five years, which is very remarkable. And Singapore Hala e marketplace is eyeing about 50 million sales in our first years of our launch. So this is amazing, you know, for a small country like Singapore. So let me give you an overview of the ASEAN Hala markets. ASEAN country overall has got 622 million people in this region. And it is believed that by 2050, it will be the fourth largest economy in the world. So halal industry in Southeast Asia country is a potential market around 65% of the Muslim world are located in Southeast Asia. So for the country population, as you can see, Myanmar is 54 million, Cambodia 16 million, Indonesia 273 million, Laos is 7.2, Malaysia 32 million, Philippines 109 million, and Singapore 5.8 million, Vietnam 97, Thailand 69, and Brunei is about 437,000. So you can see that these are all growing rapidly in terms of population as also the economic activity. So as we can see that this halal 
food market and beverages is projected to reach 1.9 trillion by the year 2023 and beyond. So ASEAN has the potential to be the key player in that growth. So especially we can see that surrounding even in Japan, also they are also establishing a new emerging marketplace for Hala global Hawa industry. The New Zealand government is also very supportive and developing the Hala meat markets and moving into Hala certifications for many of the countries that exports the meat. Now next is Australia, it's also the world largest food exporter. And you can see that the meat and grains and Australia currently is the fourth largest exporter of halal food and beverages to the OCC. So you can see that this is so energetic and a great opportunity, right? So as you can see, my summary, Hala food is a big opportunity here and it's going to be a key major uh, event where we can look into the food, the cosmetic, the pharmaceutical, and also, you know, I welcome all our Muslim friends to come to Singapore and visit our small little country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tan. Uh, that is actually a good presentation. And thanks to all our panelists for such a, a comprehensive uh, background and information about their organizations. I think without much ado, I'm looking at the clock as well. There might be some questions. I will rather give that opportunity to, to the audience to engage, whether online or the audience that is here with us in the, in the auditorium. But I must first of all say, you've uh, mentioned uh, all the panelists, there are some common things that they have mentioned in their, in their presentations, which brings me back to, to the issue of this, the size or the growing growth prospects of, this, uh, uh, of the halal industry, uh, especially in, in, in the continent. Uh, the recent studies show that the African halal market grew by $159 billion, which is equivalent to 2.4 trillion rands uh, between 19, uh, 2015 and 2020. And, the, and they, have the, they forecast that it will grow at a CARGR of 7.7% uh, between 2020 to 2020. 26, which is quite a, a huge market, and uh, there are prospects for growth in that, according to research and uh, market.com. And actually, given the African uh, continent free trade area, which is a market of over 1 billion people, and the readiness of KwaZulu Natal to be a, a major hub in terms of. Uh, what, developing the, the, the halal market, I think uh, we, we are actually in for a big, a big growth in this, in this aspect, given the, the pressure to increase growth, attract investment, and also when we talk about investment in KZN, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we are not inward looking only, we are also looking at uh, potential and opportunities for exports. As you have seen, uh, presentation from ASEAN, from Turkey. Turkey is one of the biggest uh, halal uh, sector markets. You look around, it's, it's quite big, the financial institutions that are here. But I would like, I have some few questions, but I would like the audience to engage, maybe the, the panel, uh, before we, we, we finalize with some questions. From, from, from my point of view. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be a rotating mask. We'll start here and then we'll look at uh, if uh, virtually there are some questions 
that have been posted. Uh, thank you very much. You will show by raising your hand if you have a question or a comment. Is there any question? Uh, virtually, is there any question that has been posted? Okay, not yet. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think there are very important things. I will ask uh, first ask uh, especially uh, the colleagues from our financial ins institution, both FNB and Standard Bank in particular. Uh, there, there's been a mention of a financial sector regulatory uh, framework, which is very important. Uh, compliance uh, standards, infrastructure, and I would like to know uh, from uh, the colleagues from uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Muhammad from FNP and also Mr. Hassin from uh, Standard Bank, how do they envisage as, as the banks, particularly their presence is big in South Africa, how do they envisage to, to play this role of uh, creating opportunities, investment opportunities in KZN, working, of course, with government, various sectors, and including the, the other funding institutions that are around uh, KZN. What would be the, the, success, the success factors, if I may ask that, for us to make sure that there are support measures that are put in place for these uh, investments to succeed. Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Hassan. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. I think from a, from a standard bank perspective, if you look at some of the, the public announcements that we've made over the past few, uh, few months, at least the past 12 to 18 months, we've been very clear on a pivot on our group strategy from being a traditional financial services organization to becoming a platform business and what we have termed an ecosystem curator. And for me, what that means is specifically our intention of being here today. Some of the statistics that you, that you point out in terms of the African continent, there's a billion people in Africa, 650 million of that billion people are Muslim. If you go north of the Sahara, 90% of the population is Muslim. So if you look at the opportunity specifically within the African continent, uh, and our position in terms of an, an African bank, uh, we believe that that opportunity is ripe. In terms of what we would look at in terms of how we would facilitate this investment, I think if I were to just apply a traditional financial, uh, financial mindset, more often than not, the first thing is that we look at is does the investment case stack up? Um, and we, we see more often than not when we look at uh, and I go back to some of the introductory comments that I made. More often than not, when we look at South Africa, we, we are immediately received with this negative connotation of uh, everything that we see in the press. So for me, the first thing that I believe we should start doing as a country is we need to, and, and a province from a KZN perspective, is we need to start showcasing more our actual companies that are, that are in the country. For me, I believe that it's an important thing that we need to start doing, is showcasing the brilliant companies that we actually have and the investment thesis associated with those companies uh, in our country. The second thing is we, we see some of the global statistics that are coming out from, a, from a, an Islamic economy perspective, specifically within the Islamic capital markets is we find ourselves in a position where you have surplus liquidity within the, within the Sharia market. What that is, based on last statistics that we've seen, there's north of $250 billion of Sharia cash in the, in the global Islamic economy that is looking to be deployed into Sharia compliant assets. And I think what that means from an investment destination perspective in South Africa, given that we have the regulatory environment to accommodate such investment, is we need to start identifying as businesses, as sovereigns, as municipalities, how do we access this pool of capital? 
How do we start crafting an investment case that speaks to this particular pool of capital? And again, uh, piercing through that veil of rating the sovereign. But what is the rating of, if I were to ask, and many of us actually don't know this answer, is what, of, what is the rating of some of our state-owned entities? We actually don't know. But if you go through to our state-owned enterprises, we actually have some great state-owned enterprises that are actually well run. What is the rating of our municipality of Iteguini? As a, as a municipality, we have assets on our balance sheet that we could potentially utilize to access these pools of capital. So for me, I think what I would really like to see as a banker, coming out from, uh, from today's uh, specific event hosted by the KZN Department of Trade of Industry is how do we start engaging each other in identifying access to these pools of capital? There is this pool of capital. We know that it exists. We've heard seminars and read documents a uh, hundred times over of this diversified pool of capital that we need to start accessing. But in order to operationalize this, it is that private-public partnership that we need to actually start entrenching and properly engaging, not just at the sovereign level, but even at that municipality level, at our corporate level, Let's try and foster these relationships after today and start seeing how we tap into those pools of capital. Th thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sun. Uh, we'll, we'll also ask Mr. Muhammad from uh, FNB if he can also come in. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, I can't agree more with my colleague, uh, Amin Hassan. And I think we're at the point where Islamic infrastructure financing is no longer a novelty. Hmm. It is now a viable alternate or an addition to the conventional infrastructure financing models that we find ourselves in. From our humble roots of providing Sharia alternate solutions uh, for the retail market, Islamic finance now has established itself with a firm footing in large scale projects across many Islamic and Western countries. Um, we've heard from our, from our colleagues in Singapore and other parts of the world of how these types of infrastructure projects across the globe are positively impacting on the industry that we work in. So over the recent decades, Islamic financing products have evolved continuously to match this increasing need for large-scale liquidity and the demand for liquidity is being met by financial institutions like ourselves um, by the creation of Islamic debt capital markets and beyond that on a smaller level are the non-financial institution investors such as takaful companies that do Islamic insurance, pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Um, from a product perspective, I think the organizations have, ro have risen to be able to develop products that actually meet the challenges of a modern world. And I think one of the key points that I just want to touch on that, um, you know, maybe you know, I, I spoke of in, in my introduction, but is this natural evolution in the infrastructure financing schemes, which dovetails with these ESG principles that we talk of. And I think one of the most relevant <clears throat> items is the potential impact of an infrastructure project on the economical topography. So when we look at the formulation of sound Islamic financing uh, structures, which are often centered on the economics rather than the underlying Islamic ethos or the halal nature. Many practitioners are then familiar with the normal restrictions on, co on, on common uh, economic activities, which sometimes are diverse or move away from Sharia principles, which will include you know, alcohol uh, type industries or interest-based business or you know, um, industries that, that operate in a haram type structure. So however, at a deeper level, Islamic finance principles are espoused on these principles of social, environmental, good governance and economic justice. And despite the overarching understanding, one would be hard pressed to find an objective framework such as the one that we have in the Islamic financing world. So one of the key points that I'm bringing is that as we look at developing our South African economy, our KZN economy, the model imperative becomes much stronger. And I think 
when you look at, for example, green bonds or green Sukuk principles, um, they're based on parameters which leave ample room for interpretation, making, making it easy to actually apply in what we're trying to achieve. So at our bank, we have a strong collaboration with our public sector banking division, where we look to find solutions for local municipalities, <clears throat> for the national sovereign. And I think that this partnership uh, between ourselves and public sector banking will definitely yield in positive results where we're able to bring to the front um, the intention, the strategy, the structure, and the idea of halal economies and halal investments. And I think the practitioners, all of us that are sitting around this table, all of us that are attending this function today, the conference, will allow us to actually <clears throat> make this a reality. So realistically, there's no one size uh, that fits all solution. It will be difficult to formulate a comprehensive standalone Sharia framework. However, if we look at the successes that we've already achieved in South Africa, and particularly within the KZN um, region, I think we have so much that we can draw on. And we've heard of the strong infrastructure that we have. I think now, our, our role and responsibility as Islamic bankers and financiers is to work together to grow not just South Africa, but the individual regions, local municipalities for the benefit of all. Uh, thank you, Kaya. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, I think uh, summing up from uh, both banks, major banks, what is important is uh, partnerships. Uh, creating a conducive climate for, for investment because truly speaking investment is about taking a risk and if you see that uh, the risk is uh, well uh, what you call mitigated and reduced for you to, to put money there then you are actually encouraged so which, which I, I, I think is a case now that the, the government is leading uh, in terms of this, the, the regulatory environment in the financial sector is quite uh, sound and good and, and the banks are, are, are available uh, to, to, to actually uh, assist in financing. As, as uh, Mr. Sen has mentioned that there's surplus liquidity that uh, uh, investors can tap into in terms of uh, developing this, this sector is quite encouraging. But uh, I'm not sure if there's any question or there's a hand o over there. So you just rotate a mask, uh, uh, sorry, a mic. We, we've been uh, wearing masks for two years now. So that's why I'm saying a mask instead of a mic. You just take a mask, a mic there. <laughs> And you introduce yourself and maybe your organization and then you can make a, a comment or, 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 or pass a, a question. Uh, is there any other hand from the audience? Or virtually are there any questions or comments that you can also read for, for the panelists? Uh, th thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to the panel. Uh, my name is Max Kunan. Uh, I'm from Rufus Bay IPZ. So I want to know from the panel, um, uh, on the context of South Africa, uh, in South Africa, okay, the, the, the halal is linked to the religion, and knowing South Africa is more of a Christian, and then looking at the, the prospect of halal in South Africa in a context of Christi Christianity, and then begin to, how do we, as we try to make this uh, uh, halal sector to thrive in South Africa, how do we now deal with the issue of a religion within the space? Because I foresee that as a big um, uh, hassle, trying to convince uh, communities and all that to say, look, uh, what do we do about the religious element on it? So I need the clarity on that within the space and the conversation of halal and the context of a, of a religion, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you very much.
thank, thank you, Mr. Ngane. I think uh, any panelists can sure. answer that one. Thanks. Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Um, my colleague Zubair uh, on the line mentioned something. We got it right in the banking sector or the finance sector where we've branded and showed up in the marketplace very clearly saying that this is something not particular to Muslims. And do I believe that it is something that can cross the financial barrier into all the other sectors of halal? Absolutely, for many reasons. I think first and foremost, if you just look at the pure technical specification of what halal is and stack it up against the three world major religions, which is Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, you would find that, or what we would broadly know as the Abrahamic faiths and possibly the three largest religious denominations in, in South Africa, you would find that the concept of halal and what Aman mentioned as tayyib or goodness is exactly the same within all of these religions. Even if you broaden that into uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and all of the other major world religions, what you actually start to see is that the concepts of goodness and healthy food and healthy produce and the halal ecosystem that everybody's starting to, to speak about is actually a common golden thread across all of the major world religions. And if you are a religious or agnostic or atheist, it is still within some form of moral or ethical fiber uh, within us as human beings. So I absolutely resound what you're saying. I think there is effort that is needed for all of us within, as practitioners within the halal industry to start opening up what halal is to the broader, broader universe and eradicate the notion that this is something, uh, something for Muslims. I agree with you, and I think it is something that us as Muslims within South Africa need to work more on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I want to add one thing. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my colleague rightly mentioned, uh, I would like to explain that Islamic finance is a system which can be utilized or operated by Muslims and non-Muslims. Yes, but for Muslims, they have an extra advantage that it is according to their religious beliefs. But for our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, that is a very good system for banking and finance, which cannot affect to their religion. For example, I'm utilizing Samsung phone. And this Samsung phone, I'm utilizing Android system, which is made by non-Muslim and I'm the Muslim. I'm, the, I'm utilizing a system, Android system, which is made by non-Muslim. Either that affect to my religion? No. I'm being the Muslim, I'm the utilizer of the non-Muslim system or made by non-Muslim people. Similarly, if any non-Muslim brother and sister may utilize our Islamic banking product, it will not affect to their religion. There is a system, a very good system for banking and finance, very good system for the risk, financial risk management in the shape of the car food, very good system for the poverty alleviation and social development in the, through Islamic microfinance and etc. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. I think that has actually addressed the, the question. I also personally, I, I eat uh, what uh, halal food and I found it very delicious as, as well. So I think we, that is a kind of a promotion and information sharing that needs to be, to be done going forward as part of creating an ecosystem for developing this, uh, this sector in, in South Africa. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, my name is Simtem Mapu. I'm also from the Richards Bay IDZ. Uh, my question is directed to the colleagues from the banking sector, Islamic banking sector. I think the idea of partnerships uh, between Islamic finance and uh, call it non-Islamic finance is, is a noble one. But I think what I'm curious about it is at a practical level, uh, especially from a compliance point of view uh, with the Sharia uh, compliance uh, components, uh, are there practical examples of um, co-funding uh, 
initiatives that have taken place and how is compliance handled? Is it handled at a, a, a deal uh, entry point of view or, or is the compliance managed throughout the life of the asset? Because uh, that would be quite interesting to understand. As you said, I mean, earlier there's excess capital that's available and for me it makes sense for us to be able to look at uh, uh, opportunities that could uh, be leveraged if there's capital that, that's available to fund. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I can I take that, uh, Ms. Kaya? Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. can you come Thank in? you. I think the best case study uh, put forth is the 2014 Sukuk issuance that South Africa as a sovereign made for the sum of $500 million. Um, it was the lowest dollar funding that the South African sovereign had received since 1994 at 3.94%. So let that sink in, $500 million at 3.94% for a 10 year of 5.75 years. Um, the $500 million that were raised was used to build tunnels and dams to benefit the people of South Africa. This is a classic example where the Islamic industry or Islamic finance industry worked with government to raise this money, to deploy the money, and to successfully pay back to the investors. This sukuk was so popular that it was oversubscribed by four times and was sold out within a matter of 10 minutes. Um, the largest investors in the South African sukuk were Chinese, Japanese, Germans and American investors. Um, that should be some testament to the structure and the demand for these types of structures. As far as your question on compliance goes, uh, I strongly believe having, been, having worked in this industry for more than 25 years now, is that when we work with an Islamic finance structure, we have an additional safety net of compliance, govern, governance, and adherence to legislation. So not only do these deals, structures, um, and transactions adhere to the normal secular legislation of the South African Banks Act, the South African National Taxation Act, and a whole host of other pieces of legislation, but we also have to then adhere to the very specific principles of Sharia um, which is then supervised by independent non-executive Sharia scholars that serve on each of these Islamic financial institutions, which you will find present in FNB Islamic Banking and also as with my friend at Standard Bank. Um, we then have to adhere to not just the secular rules, but these Islamic principles as well. And I think the net result that you see is a rather uh, clean, robust structure that would stand up to the scrutiny of any auditor or inspector that you would find. So, so much so is the success of these types of structures that national government are looking to work with us again to launch similar type structures. Um, in terms of these public sector partnerships with large institutions like FNB and Standard Bank. Um, I think there is comfort in the knowledge that there would be no shortcuts and all necessary regulation and supervision would be adhered to. Uh, I hope that addresses the question that was posed. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone would like to add something. Uh, if uh, if I allow, I think some of the thanks, Aman, for that. Uh, I think maybe just some of the practical elements that I we just want to close off, which which I uh, I'm assuming I'm making an assumption, but I subtly heard it coming through uh, through the question. Is I think the 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 practicality of it is one. There is a quantitative element to the investment and there is a qualitative element to the investment. So those two elements are one, the underlying investment itself needs to be Sharia compliant. 
So um, obviously we won't be able to go and put up a tobacco plant uh, or an alcohol plant. So from a qualitative perspective, there would have to be a sectoral screen to ensure that the underlying investment is, is Sharia compliant. From a quantitative perspective, we need to ensure that there is no uh, impermissible income that is generated from the investment, or if there is any, we have a means of purifying, uh, purifying that income. And the third element that I maybe just want to close off, there is nothing that prevents a Muslim and non-Muslim from co-investing in a project together. If there is a viable investment opportunity that all parties are, are able to invest in, uh, we've seen plenty of instances uh, through the ages of really great commercial structures that were put in place. So I want to maybe just add those three elements uh, to, to what my colleague Amman has mentioned. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'm going to stand I, now I because I want, to, I want us to move towards uh, wrapping up. Try it. For, um, are you able to hear me? I just want to, is it okay to add, uh, Kaya, can you hear me? Please, please come in, sir, and add. Yes. Uh, so I just, uh, what I'd like to do, just from my end, just uh, share some insights around the tourism sector, and I think how Muslim and non-Muslim uh, product owners uh, have collaborated with each other in order to service the needs of the Muslim traveler. Um, I mean, just in terms from a tourism perspective, you know, the, the, the Muslim travelers rank among the top spenders when it comes coming to spend, uh, when, when it comes to tourism. But within South Africa, we, we've seen some really good uh, collaboration happening, and in particular, even in KZN, where we've seen some hotel owners uh, and product owners ensuring that they're taking care of the need of the Muslim traveler. And you see from a product perspective, both Muslim travelers, tourists, and non-Muslim tourists um, in the same, uh, experiencing the same product, but Co coincidentally, the Muslim travelers are also being taken care of and the non-Muslim needs are taken care of. So in terms of, of collaboration, I think um, there is a great opportunity. And I think if you just look at the tourism sector and see some of the, the, the wins that the tourism sector has had, and, and as I mentioned, it's just not linked to, to the halal food. It's, there are other elements uh, linked to the tourism value chain that you've seen non-Muslim product owners offer that to our Muslim travelers. Um, and they've seen a benefit, they've seen a growth in their revenue, um, they've seen a growth from a marketing perspective. Um, so I thought just uh, for me to add and just to, to kind of say that there is an opportunity to, to jointly collaborate, uh, you know, and, and increase both uh, from, a, from an investment point of view and also just from a revenue perspective, uh, you know, taking care of the needs of, of the Muslim traveler. They've seen a remarkable increase in revenue and in turnover. And, and, has it, and there hasn't been a huge investment uh, needed or required. It's just more understanding what is the need of the Muslim traveler when it comes uh, for them traveling in, in, um, and, and what they're particularly looking for. Um, and also, I mean, just looking at restaurants as well, you can see Muslim and non-Muslim uh, patrons uh, enjoying their meals. Um, and, and basically both, take, both of their needs are taken care of. Uh, in an Islamic environment and also in an environment that takes uh, that, that ensures Sharia compliance as well. Uh, I think uh, Claude over there would like to say something, but I, I was still going to give the last round of 30 seconds for each uh, panel member to to say words on uh, as parting shot to listen to this audience. Thank I'd actually you like to pose a question to Mr. Dindar, um, there, uh, within his role in terms of um, promotion and events, um, we see that South Africa enjoys extremely good connectivity um, to three major cities on the likes of Emirates, Qatar, and Turkish Airlines. Um, can we get an idea in terms of how um, South African tourism is positioning um, the destination, especially in these markets, uh, but also when you look at a country like Indonesia, which is uh, almost a quarter of a billion people, um, how are we presenting ourselves as an attractive destination um, in terms of generating those travelers 
who could possibly consider the offering of our destination. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Claude. Um, so one of the key um, strategies post COVID for us um, is the fact around the value chain of mobility. Um, and we do realize that airlines uh, do play a very, very critical role uh, in ensuring that uh, you know, we, we, we start seeing the return of travelers into our country. So in particular, the likes of the airlines that you mentioned, Emirates, Qatar, Turkish Airlines, and many of the other international carriers, we've been engaging with them um, quite closely um, to the point where South African Tourism has formed what we refer to as the uh, International and Regional Mobility, which I'm the project lead on, um, where these airlines are eng engaged uh, consistently and we've been working with them in terms of creating demand from uh, markets where we see uh, a, a quick turnaround, firstly and foremost, but secondly also, I think from a brand perspective, uh, they have different segments of travelers um, and they have the insights and even through our B2B channels, which is our trade and travel, tra uh, travel trade partners, we're engaging with them on joint promotions to promote the destination. I think you mentioned particularly Southeast Asia and Indonesia. I think the, the message for us um, from, a, from a destination perspective is that we promote ourselves as a destination uh, applicable to all travelers. Uh, and in particular, since we are talking around the Muslim traveler, we segment our markets as we go into the market and our messaging is very clear. Um, and what we do is we do encourage our travelers to come in and experience the products and we do this by offering uh, what we refer to as familiarization trips that are investment, where we bring travel trade partners, we bring influencers into the country. Um, we invest from a print and media perspective as well in showcasing the halal offerings. And also what we do is we have uh, in-market roadshows where we take travel trade partners and we've been fortunate enough working very closely with the KZN province. We've done some virtual webinars in Middle East. Um, we've done some in Southeast Asia. Um, over the last year, we've educated close on to over 200, 300 travel trade partners globally from, from those regions as well um, in showcasing what uh, we as a destination has to offer. So uh, I guess um, we, we have a lot more work to do, but we're working very closely with the provinces. Uh, we've adopted the strategy of ensuring that our objective is to ensure that all of the channels where travel trade partners or even consumers would be looking to travel, we make ourselves visible and then we ensure we position ourselves as a destination to all the segments of travelers, and in particular to the Muslim traveler, ensuring uh, that they do know the message is quite clear that from an infrastructure point of view, we are here to, to support them. And then locally, lastly, what we do is we've been having training sessions with both Muslim and non-Muslim product owners to help them understand how best to service the need of the Muslim traveler when they do come in um, and what their requirements would be. Um, so I think the work carries on, but I think we, we've, been, we've been hard at uh, ensuring that we promote the destination very strongly uh, to our Muslim travelers globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tinda. I think I would like to ask maybe the final round, 30 seconds each, uh, to, to all our panel members, those who would like to say something, not all of them, but those who, who still feel like saying something on a parting note on what they think could be done to take this sector forward uh, from their own organization point of view and how those collaborations could be taken forward. So uh, not necessarily in that order, but I can ask uh, uh, like we, we started if just to take a round from Mr. Hassan, Mr. Mohammed, Mr. Tinda, Mr. Mughal and Mr. Tan whoever would like to say something as a parting note, 30 seconds maximum, and then we, we close the session. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think from, from my side, I first and foremost want to say thank you to KZN Trade and uh, Investment for showcasing the opportunity within the halal sector. I think it's an important step to start this process, and as a banking practitioner within the, the halal or Islamic finance universe, we we here we open for business we here to speak to whoever is interested in investing or facilitating in exporting of our products and services of south africa to the world uh, we here to be of assistance as best we can thank you sir. over to you yes. uh, uh, panelists uh, virtually 
Kaya, thank you. My message is quick. Um, I think it's all about partnership and collaboration. Um, I want to thank the organizers for putting together a very relevant uh, discussion and topic. And um, I want to thank my fellow panelists and uh, um, this opportunity should not be overlooked. And as a bank, we're here to support anyone that is interested to further these interests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, on behalf of uh, South African Tourism, um, I just want to say thank you to uh, TIKZN um, for, for hosting me today and also for the opportunity to be able to engage um, around the tourism uh, opportunities. Um, we just like to say that uh, our, our objective is quite clear from uh, and the mandate is quite clear from a tourism perspective. Uh, we need to create the demand. Um, and we will create, continue to create the demand in joint collaboration with all of the private sector to ensure that um, the South Africa remains on top of mind for many of our travelers wanting to come and travel to South Africa. And in return, by doing so, we increase uh, and contribute to the GDP of the country, which in return also helps from an investment perspective. So um, we look forward to welcoming many of our travelers who have tuned in virtually and also for those that are there in, in presence, we look uh, forward to see if, for you to go out and experience what TKZN has to offer and what the province has to offer. I know there's some exciting opportunities, and some nice uh, sightseeing that has been arranged. Um, so do enjoy the province um, and we look forward to welcoming you to South Africa um, and thanks again for this opportunity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, on behalf of Al Huda Center for Islamic Banking and Economics, I would like to thank to the organizers and especially thank to Muhammad Ali Jana to organize World Halal Day every year in different parts of the world. I'm sure that uh, halal and the concept of halal is for all, not only for Muslim, as in halal we have a concept of tayyab, so that can be acceptable for any religion or any type of the society. So thank you very much to the organizer and I would like to thank to the panelists as well for their, for sharing the, such a wonderful knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muka. And uh, finally, the Chairman, Mr. Khan. Yes, thank you very much uh, for organizing and having me here. Uh, I would like to encourage uh, or any of the businesses to, you know, be able to utilize Singapore as a strategic locations whereby uh, we are well connected in terms of the sea, airports, and then the warehousing facility and the logistic uh, efficiency, as well as the banking uh, infrastructure that Singapore is able to provide, and especially the transparent, friendly international trade facility and policy that our, our government uh, you know, is embarking. And also the advantage of having the world-class uh, cold storage warehousing facility that uh, we can offer. The same time, also, I would like to encourage that, you know, not only that if you require any of the halal foods from Asia, uh, please feel free to let us have an understanding at the same time if you would like to export your products to Southeast Asia through Singapore as a springboard to the rest of this ASEAN country, we will be most glad to be of a service to any one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable uh, guests, uh, we, we are coming to the end of our session. Uh, first of all, let's give our, our panelists, a big hand of applause. Thank you very much. You gave us a food for thought and shared a lot of wisdom. And I think this will form a basis for establishing uh, a good uh, halal sector, uh, very uh, what called prosperous halal sector in KZN and in the country, and of course, uh, beyond borders. So we, we thank you, without your, your, your wisdom, we didn't have this kind of insight that we are going to have uh, go, going forward. And I think 
for all uh, our potential investors, those who are interested. I think uh, our colleagues at TIKZN are available. TIKZN is here, they can facilitate uh, funding uh, by financial institutions, government, because government need, needs to come in partnership and assist with relevant infrastructure and support measures. So all those things are in place. It's a matter of uh, getting uh, a TIKZ and to play that uh, facilitative role. There are also other funding institutions uh, uh, based in KZN, uh, uh, Itala, uh, uh, KZN Growth Fund, that can also come in partnership and mm -hmm. come in handy in terms of making sure that this uh, becomes a reality. Uh, thank you very much. My, my role has now come to an end, and thank you. You've been a very good audience, and let's give a big hand of applause to you as well. Yeah. Over to you, Mr. Ngamu. This is an executive uh, that is responsible for business development, uh, you know, in investment promotion. Is at the center of TIKZN. So this is the face you must look for at TIKZN. Thanks. No, thanks, Kaya, and thanks uh, to all the delegates. Uh, Mr. Claude Pretorius will make an announcement. I'm just here to hand over uh, the gift to our speaker. Claude. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our program. And um, just with the awarding of the gift to our colleague from Standard Bank, thank you to all the colleagues online. Um, for those of you who've received invitations for tonight's Thank dinner, you. You. please note that dinner starts promptly at 6 p.m. this evening. Dinner will start promptly at 6 p.m. this evening You would, if you've w received an invitation for tonight. Tomorrow's program, again, a jam-packed program, will focus on trade, leveraging the intra the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement in terms of growing trade and looking at how we can leverage the halal sector in that regard. So we look forward to seeing you at dinner tonight and bright and early tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. in this auditorium. Thank you very much for your attendance. We look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.